Hello everybody, good evening, welcome, welcome on in. Just getting set up here. Welcome, good to see everybody. I do have comments turned off, uh, so I can go ahead and read uh, tonight. I do have a label here, just making sure I'm in frame. Hello, welcome, thank you Olga, appreciate that. All right, so I think I am in frame well enough. Um, I'm not sure, I think, I think we're okay. Hopefully everyone can see my little sticky note down here. There we go, I think that's a little bit better. Okay, well welcome in everybody. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, I do have comments turned off uh, so I can just read through um, the motion that was filed today. So I'll read through the motion. It's only about 24 pages. It's a quick read. It's <laughs> it's a quick read. Uh, and then I will turn on comments so we can kind of go through uh, and do a Q&A after we finish up uh, going through the motion here. So welcome in. It's good to see you all. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. This is a filing from uh, Jack Smith. So this is the government's filing and we had spoken before. There had been a request for uh, jury instructions, uh, proposed jury instructions uh, in the Florida case. Uh, it was a bit of an unusual order by uh, Judge Cannon, but uh, then Jack has responded and this is his response. So we have the government's response to the order requiring preliminary proposed jury instructions and verdict forms on counts 1 through 32. Now there are more than 32 counts in the Florida case. The 32 are for each one of the documents. So we'll go ahead and just dive right in. The court has issued an order directing the parties to file preliminary proposed jury instructions and verdict forms for counts 1 through 32 of the superseding indictment with a specific requirement that the parties engage with two competing scenarios and offer alternative draft text that assumes each scenario to be correct, a correct formulation of the law to be issued to the jury. Both scenarios rest on an unstated and fundamentally flawed legal premise, namely that the Presidential Records Act, and in particular its distinction between personal and presidential records, determines whether a former president is authorized under the Espionage Act to possess highly classified documents and store them in an unsecure facility despite contrary rules in Executive Order 13526, which governs the possession and storage of classified information. That legal premise is wrong, and a jury instruction for Section 793 that reflects that premise would distort the trial. The uh, Presidential Record Act's distinction between personal and presidential records has no bearing on whether a former president's possession of documents containing national defense information is authorized under the Espionage Act and the PRA should play no role in the jury instructions on the elements of Section 793. Indeed, based on the current record, the PRA should not play any role at trial at all. Moreover, it is vitally important that this that the court promptly decide whether the unstated legal premise underlying the recent order does in the court's view represent a correct formulation of the law. If the court wrongly concludes that it does and that it intends to include the PRA in the jury instructions regarding what is authorized under Section uh, 793, it must inform the parties of that decision well in advance of the trial. The government must have an opportunity to consider appellate review well before jeopardy attaches. So this is where he's saying he will appeal if that is what she is choosing to do. Uh, citing the Wexler case, the adoption of clearly erroneous jury instructions that entail a high probability of failure of a prosecution, a failure the government could not then seek to remedy by appeal or otherwise constitutes the kind of extraordinary situation in which we are empowered to issue the writ of mandamus. And uh, this is probably the worst, <laughs> that is one of the worst things that can happen if you feel a judge isn't uh, acting appropriately, a writ of mandamus is the uh, strongest thing that you can file. Courts have permitted the government to obtain writs of mandamus when a proposed criminal jury instruction clearly violated the law, risked prejudicing the government at trial with jeopardy attached, and provided the government no other avenue of appeal. 
If, for example, the court concludes as posited in scenario A in the court's order that under the Espionage Act, a former president is authorized to possess any document that the jury determines qualifies as a personal record as defined by the Presidential Records Act, that would wrongly present to the jury a factual determination that should have no legal consequence under the elements of Section 793. Likewise, if the court concludes as posited in scenario B that a president has carte blanche to remove any document from the White House at the end of his presidency, that any document so removed must be treated as a personal record under the PRA as an unreviewable matter of law, and that also as a matter of law, a former president is forever authorized to possess such a document regardless of how highly classified it may be and how it is stored that would constitute a clearly erroneous jury instruction that entails a high probability of failure of a prosecution, and the government must be provided with an opportunity to seek prompt appellate review. So again, the second time he's pulling in this issue, uh, saying that he would seek an appeal. As in any case, the court may defer ruling on certain aspects of jury instructions where the applicability or non-applicability of the instruction turns on the evidence that is presented at trial, for example, whether the jury should be instructed on how to evaluate law enforcement testimony or how to evaluate expert witness testimony will turn on whether such witness actually testifies at trial. Such decisions can obviously be deferred, but the question of whether the PRA has an impact on the element of unauthorized possession under Section 793E does not turn on any evidentiary issue, and it cannot be deferred. It is purely a question of law that must be decided promptly. If the court were to defer a decision on that fundamental question, it would inject substantial delay into the trial and worse, prevent the government from seeking review before jeopardy attaches. The court must not defer ruling on a pretrial motion if the deferral will adversely affect a party's right to appeal. As instructed by the court, the government below provides a clear and well-supported jury instruction for the elements of Section 793E. The proposed instruction correctly instructs the jury that the element of unauthorized possession depends on the plain language of the statute, Executive Order 13526, and the Executive Order's implementing regulations, and it makes no mention of the purported designations under the PRA. As required by the court's order, the government also provides proposed jury instructions that incorporate the inaccurate legal premise reflected in the court's order under scenarios A and B. Furthermore, even though resolution of the threshold legal question is purely a matter of law, the court should be aware at the outset that Trump's entire effort to rely on the PRA is not based on any facts. It is a post hoc justification that was concocted more than a year after he left the White House, and his invocation in this court of the PRA is not grounded in any decision he actually made during his presidency to designate as personal any of the records charged in the superseding indictment. Accordingly, before turning to the jury instructions, the government below provides the court with factual context surrounding Trump's attempt to inject the PRA into these proceedings. Importantly, Trump has never represented to the court that he is that he, in fact, designated the classified documents as personal. He made no such claim in his motion to dismiss in his reply or at the hearing on March 14th of 2024, despite every opportunity and every incentive to do so. As discussed below, the reason is simple. He never did so. Instead, he has attempted to fashion out of a whole cloth of legal presumption that would operate untethered to any facts without regard to his actual decisions, his actual intent, the unambiguous definition of what constitutes personal records under the PRA, or the plainly non-personal content of the highly classified documents that he retained. There is no basis in law or fact for the legal presumption, and the court should reject Trump's effort to invent one as a vehicle to inject the PRA into this case. It's pretty strong language here. Here's our background. As the government has previously explained, there is no colorable argument that any of the documents charged in the superseding indictment is a personal record under the PRA, a document of purely private or non-public character, which does not relate to or have an effect upon the carrying out of constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. 
To the contrary, the classified documents charged in the superseding indictment were all created or received by the president in the course of conducting activities which relate to or have an effect upon the carrying out of the constitutional, statutory, or other official ceremonial duties of the president, making them straightforward presidential records. Trump has not argued otherwise. Indeed, it would be pure fiction to suggest that highly classified documents created by members of the Intelligence Committee, community, and military and presented to the President of the United States during his term in office were purely private and that they do not relate to or have an effect upon the carrying out of the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the President. Trump has nevertheless sought to inject the PRA into the trial of this case by suggesting that he may have designated the documents as personal shortly before his term of office ended, that if he did so, such a designation would be impervious to the subsequent judicial review, and that his possession, possession of any documents he designated as personal under the PRA was authorized for purposes of the Espionage Act, even if contrary to Executive Order 13526. As the government has explained, those contentions are both meritless and fatally undermined by Trump's concession that the Department of Justice may seek to recover such documents in a civil suit in which a court would be perfectly free to determine whether a particular contested record was presidential, was personal, or presidential. Moreover, Trump has never suggested that he, in fact, designated the documents at issue as personal, but as, has instead sought to convert a statement made during oral argument in Judicial Watch v. NARA, a case decided in 2012, into a legal rule that treats the mere act of transferring documents from the White House to anywhere other than the National Archives and Records Administration as indistinguishable from considered decision to designate the records as personal. We have footnote number one here. In support of his presumptive records designation, Trump has also attempted to rely on the allegation in the superseding indictment that he sent the classified documents to Mar-a-Lago. But that simple factual allegation says nothing about his purported legal designation of the records as personal. Indeed, at the hearing on March 14th of 2024, the court noted that Trump's counsel was not even admitting that Trump knowingly sent the classified documents to Mar-a-Lago. Thus, he's attempting to obtain the benefit of a designation regarding the classified documents that could flow only from knowing that the documents were being sent to Mar-a-Lago, but he refuses to admit that he knew about them. The government addresses that claim in response to Trump's Rule 12 motion, but here in the context of jury instructions, the government provides the court with the factual backdrop showing that the very notion that Trump could benefit from a purported designation under the PRA was invented long after he left the White House. Subsection A. Trump did not designate the documents as personal while in office. During its exhaustive investigation, the government interviewed Trump's own PRA representatives and numerous high-ranking officials from the White House, chiefs of staff, White House counsel, and senior members of the White House counsel's office, a national security advisor, and senior members of the National Security Council. Not a single one had heard Trump say that he was designating records as personal or that at the time he caused the transfer of boxes to Mar-a-Lago, he believed that the removal of records amounted to designating them as personal under the PRA. To the contrary, every witness who was asked this question had never heard such a thing. Some of the clearest evidence that Trump did not designate the documents charged in the superseding indictment as personal while in office comes from Trump's own statements and those of his PRA representatives during the year that followed his departure from office. For example, during nearly a year of correspondence with NARA regarding the return of the boxes taken from the White House, Neither Trump nor any of his representatives suggested that Trump had designated all of the records as personal, either deliberately, implicitly, presumptively, or otherwise. To the contrary, everyone involved in his in this back and forth agreed that they, there were presidential records that had been taken to Mar-a-Lago that needed to be located and returned to NARA. Likewise, in his off-the-record interview with a writer and publicist on July 21st of 2021, 
Trump himself never suggested that the classified documents he revealed to them were personal or that he was free to do uh, with them whatever he chose. Instead, he said that they were highly confidential and remained classified, despite the fact that he had removed them from the White House and taken them to his personal residence. Later, after Trump provided 15 boxes to NARA, the Archivist of the United States advised Congress in a letter released to the public on February 18th of 2022 that NARA had identified items marked as classified national security information within the boxes and therefore had been in communication with the Department of Justice. Footnote 2. And that is a citation. Trump released a public statement in response the same day, stating that, quote, the National Archives did not find anything. They were given upon request presidential records in ordinary and routine process to ensure the preservation of my legacy and in accordance with the Presidential Records Act. But note three is another citation here. These were Trump's own words, and there's no hint that he considered the documents to be anything other than presidential records. Subsection B, the notion that Trump might have designated the documents was as personal was first invented in February of 2022. On February 7th of 2022, the Washington Post reported that in January, NARA had retrieved 15 boxes of documents and other items from former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence because the material should have been turned over to the agency when he left the White House. Footnote 4. It's a citation to the Washington Post article. That article quoted a statement by the archivist noting the Presidential Records Act is critical to our democracy in which the government is held accountable by the people. At that point, the public reporting related only to Trump's non-compliance with the PRA. The fact that he had retained highly classified materials did not become public for several days. On February 8th of 2022, the day after the Washington Post article was published, the president of the president of Judicial Watch posted the following two statements on Twitter. And we have footnote five, which is a citation to Twitter here. <coughs> fact check, the left media is being dishonest about the Trump records issue. The fact has, uh, the president has discretion on what docs to retain as presidential records while in office, so the law allows Trump to tear up documents, shred them, and take documents when he left the White House. Fun story, Judicial Watch sued over Bill Clinton's hiding records in his sock drawer. Court told us to pound sand because presidents essentially can do whatever they want with their records. Remember this when you hear anti-Trump media caterwauling about his tearing up documents. Those are specific quotes on Twitter. Immediately after posting the second tweet, the Judicial Watch president sent to an employee in Trump's post-presidency office a link to the tweet and offered to discuss the issue with Trump. A few hours later, the Judicial Watch president sent the same person his analysis of the case, uh, Judicial Watch v. Nara, 2012. That evening, the Judicial Watch president circulated to an employee a proposed public statement for Trump's consideration, which included language that the PRA and judicial decisions gave Trump the right to keep the documents he returned to NARA. The statement never issued. Around this time, the Judicial Watch president, who was not an attorney, told another Trump employee that Trump was being given bad advice and that the records Trump possessed at Mar-a-Lago should have been categorized as personal. The second employee advised the Judicial Watch president that they disagreed with the Judicial Watch president's analysis in Judicial Watch. Former President Clinton had made the designation of certain uh, records personal while president, whereas Trump had not done so. The second employee further informed Trump that the Judicial Watch president was wrong and explained why. Nevertheless, on February 10th of 2022, Trump released a statement claiming in part, quote, I've been told I was under no obligation to give the material based on various legal rulings that have been made over the years, end quote. Footnote six is the uh, citation. Before this time, the second employee had never heard this theory from Trump. No other witness recalled Trump's, Trump espousing this theory until the Judicial Watch president conveyed it to him in February of 2022. Sub C. 
Trump and his attorneys nevertheless continued to acknowledge that the documents were presidential, not personal records. Even after the February 2022 discussion with the Judicial Watch president, Trump and his attorneys continue to acknowledge that the classified records at issue in this case were presidential rather than personal. For example, in May of 2022, Trump's former attorney accepted service of a grand jury subpoena requiring Trump's post-presidency office to produce any documents with the classification markings in its or the former president's custody. Trump did not seek to quash the subpoena or argue in any way that he did not have to comply because he had designated any classified records as personal under the PRA. Instead, he hid most of those documents from his lawyer, made false statements to mask his continued possession of them, and attempted to enlist his lawyer in concealing or destroying the classified records. Around the same time, Trump's former attorney sent the government a letter setting out, among other things, some legal theories related to the government's investigation. Trump's counsel requested that the government include a letter on any application made in connection with any investigation request concerning this investigation, and the government duly attached it to the affidavit in support of the warrant to search Mar-a-Lago. Moreover, in the letter, Trump's former attorney further characterized any documents with classification markings at Mar-a-Lago as follows, quote, there have been public reports about an investigation by DOJ into presidential records purportedly marked as classified among materials that were once in the White House and unknowingly included among the boxes brought to Mar-a-Lago by the movers. Those were the words of Trump's counsel directly addressing the classified documents at issue in this case. The fictional PRA defense was nowhere to be found. Trump's attorneys took a similar approach in litigation after the execution of the search warrant at Mar-a-Lago. For example, in September 1st of 2022, hearing before this court, Trump's counsel repeatedly described the records at issue as presidential. Quote, what we are talking about here in the main are the presidential records in the hands of the 45th president of the United States at a location that was used frequently during his term as president to conduct official business. This is, as I say, presidential records in the hand of the 45th president of the United States. And in there are, again, presidential records in the hands of the 45th president of the United States. And he made those representations to the court, not only orally, but in writing. In Trump's reply, filed the day before the hearing, he quoted the definition of personal records under the PRA and distinguished presidential records from documents containing highly personal information, such as diaries, journals, and medical records. The items he identified as personal were plainly not classified documents, and, were, and nowhere did he suggest that the classified documents at issue in this case had been designated personal. The implausibility of Trump's fiction was also readily apparent to the 11th Circuit, which also distinguished personal items like medical documents, correspondence related to taxes, and accounting information from the highly classified documents at issue in this case. For our part, we cannot discern why plaintiff would have an individual interest in the need for any of the 100 documents with classification markings. Classified documents are marked to show that they're classified, for instance, with their classification level. They are owned by, produced by, or for, or under the control of the United States government. And they include information, uh, the unauthorized disclosure of which could reasonably be expected to cause identifiable and describable damage to the national security. As the 11th Circuit concluded, plaintiff does not have a possessory interest in the documents at issue, so he does not suffer a cognizable harm if the United States reviews documents he neither owns nor has personal interest in. On February 22nd of 2024, more than three years later after leaving office, Trump advanced the argument to this court that because the superseding indictment alleged that he caused boxes to be transported to Mar-a-Lago, the court should treat that act as equivalent to a considered decision to designate the records as personal and should further hold that such designation is both unreviewable in a criminal trial and dispositive of whether he was legally authorized to possess documents containing classified information for purposes of the Espionage Act. The court, re the court should reject Trump's post hoc legal invention and the PRA should play no role in this trial. Footnote 7 here. 
the government has previously acknowledged the theoretical possibility that Trump could offer a factual defense at trial that he did not act willfully because he in fact designated the documents as personal and in fact mistakenly believed that the PRA provided him with authorization to keep and withhold classified records from NARA and the grand jury. But moving from this from theory to an actual trial defense requires evidence and as the background section shows, Trump has no evidence to support such a factual defense because he and his representatives repeatedly characterized the records as presidential rather than personal long after he left the White House. Regardless, such a defense, even if available as a factual matter, would have no bearing on the element of unauthorized possession and would not require a modification to the government's proposed jury instructions for Section 793. Discussion. The court must decide whether the unstated legal premise embedded in the court's recent order represents a correct formulation of the law. That is, whether the PRA's distinction between personal and presidential records determines whether possession is authorized or unauthorized under Section 793E. The answer to that question is plainly no for the reasons set forth at length in the government's response to Trump's motion to dismiss. In short, during the period charged in the indictment, authorization to possess classified information was governed by Executive Order 13526 and its implementing regulations, which applied to Trump as a former president. Nothing in the PRA remotely purports to override the Executive Order 13526 and construing it in that atextual manner would raise serious constitutional concerns. We have footnote 8 here. Because the PRA and the authorities at issue in this case do not conflict, the PRA does not impliedly repeal the government's authorities, citing the Carceri case. Absent a clearly expressed congressional intention, an implied repeal will only be found where provisions in two statutes are irreconcilable, are irreconcilable conflict or where the latter act covers the whole subject or the earlier one and is clearly intended as a substitute. Uh, citing a second case, when Congress passes two statutes that may touch on the same subject, we give effect to both unless doing so would be impossible. The government's proposed jury instruction presented first below, reflects the premise that the PRA is irrelevant to the element of unauthorized possession. The two scenarios posited by the court, on the other hand, rest on the incorrect premise that a former president is authorized to possess classified information, regardless of whether he has a security clearance or a need to know, and regardless of whether he complies with applicable safeguarding regulations. So long as it is contained within a personal record, as a result, both of the court's scenarios are fundamentally flawed, and any jury instruction that reflect these scenarios would be in error. Nevertheless, as directed by the court, the government below provides jury instructions for each of these two legally erroneous scenarios. Footnote 9, the government also attaches as Exhibit 1 a draft verdict form for counts 1 through 32. No special verdict form is required. As such, the government proposes using a general verdict form for each count, regardless of how the court resolves the legal questions at issue here. Whatever the court decides, it must resolve these crucial threshold legal questions promptly. The failure to do so would improperly jeopardize the court's right to a fair trial, the government's right to a fair trial. And deprive it of its right to seek appellate review. Subsection A. Governments, oops, hold on. There we go. Deprive it of its right to seek appellate review. Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 12D, and then we're also citing case law here. So we have subsection A. Governments proposed jury instruction. The jury is correctly instructed that unauthorized possession is based on Executive Order 13526, not on the PRA. The government's proposed preliminary instruction for counts 1 through 32 is as follows, footnote 10. The government believes that the jury must decide whether the government has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the three elements listed in the proposed jury instructions above. 
Counts 1 through 32, Willful Retention of National Defense Information, 18 U.S. Code, Section 793, Sub E. Counts 1 through 32 of the superseding indictment charged Defendant Trump with the willful retention of national defense information in violation of Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 793E. The statute provides in pertinent part, quote, whoever having unauthorized possession of any document relating to the national defense willfully retains the same and fails to deliver it to the officer or employee of the United States entitled to receive it, end quote, commits a crime. In order to find Defendant Trump guilty of the crime of willfully retaining national defense information, the jury must find that the government proved the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, on or about the date set forth in the superseding indictment, Defendant Trump had unauthorized possession of the document. Second, the document related to the national defense of the United States. And third, Defendant Trump willfully retained the document and failed to deliver the document to the officer or employee of the United States entitled to receive it. <coughs> Excuse me. Put note 11 here. See also instructions given in U.S. v. Ford and also other instructions available in the U.S. v. Winner here. So citing other cases with similar instructions. For purposes of counts 1 through 32, the following definitions apply. Number one, unauthorized possession. Unauthorized possession means possession without official approval or permission. Uh, footnote 12 here. Uh, and then he is citing a dictionary defining authorized as to give official approval to or permission for. A uh, second dictionary defining authorized as sanctioned by authority, having or done with legal or official approval. The United States government has adopted rules that govern the possession of classified information. Number 13 is citing Executive Order 13526. Those rules do not apply to a sitting president, but apply to former presidents after their term in office has ended. Footnote 14 is citing uh, executive orders, uh, United States Code Section Executive Order, as well as uh, case law. Under those rules, an individual's possession possession of classified information is unauthorized. That individual does not hold a security clearance, or the individual does not have a need to know the information. Footnote 15 is under uh, another executive order, and the Ford Instruction at 45. Need to know means an appropriate government official has determined that the individual requires access to the classified information in order to perform or assist in a lawful and authorized government function. Footnote 16 is another executive order citation along with the Ford instruction here. In addition, even if an individual holds security clearance and has a need to know classified information, the individual's possession of the classified information is unauthorized if the individual removes the classified information from a secure facility or possesses the information outside of a secure facility. Footnote 17 is Executive Order uh, 4.1 along with uh, Code of Federal Regulation down here. There's the Ford Instruction 45. Possession is a commonly used and commonly understood word. Basically to possess something, in this case documents, means to own or to exert control over it. Footnote 18. Down here, Federal Jury Practice and Instructions, 6th edition. Uh, again, citations to each of these words as he's kind of going through and listing out what the instructions, proposed instructions are. The law recognizes several kinds of possession. A person may have actual or constructive possession of a thing. Actual possession of a thing occurs. Thank you, Kristen. If a person knowingly has a direct physical control of it, constructive possession of a thing occurs if the person doesn't have actual possession of that thing, but has both the power and intention to take control over it later. And then this is footnote 19, 11th Circuit Pattern Jury Instruction, uh, Instruction S6. Next instruction is the National Defense Information. The term relating to national defense is a broad term that refers to United States military and naval establishments and the related activities of national preparedness. It includes all matters that directly or may reasonably or may be reasonably connected with the defense of the United States against its enemies, as well as matters relating to the United States foreign policy and intelligence capabilities to prove that a document relies to the national relates to the national defense there are two additional things that the government must prove must prove i will pause for a moment and say all of this information is absolutely public information anyone has access to 
online. Nothing that I'm reading right now is private <laughs> or confidential. First, it must prove that the disclosure of the material would be potentially damaging to the United States or might be useful to a foreign nation or an enemy of the United States. Second, it must prove the material is closely held by the United States government. A document is closely held if the government has endeavored to keep it from the public. In determining whether material is closely held, you may consider whether it has been classified by appropriate authorities and whether it remained classified on the date or dates pertinent to the indictment. Footnote 20 down here is citing multiple cases. So we have, uh, looks like one, two, three, four, four cases plus the Ford instruction. Next, willful retention. The word willfully means that the act was committed voluntarily and purposefully with the intent to do something the law forbids, that is, with the bad purpose to disobey or disregard the law. While a person must have acted with the intent to do something the law forbids before you can find that person acted willfully, the person need not be aware of a specific law or rule that his conduct may be violating. Footnote 21. Uh, 11th Circuit Pattern Jury Instruction here, Instruction B9.1A, along with the Bryan case as well. Thank you, James. B, Scenario A, the jury is incorrectly instructed. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's back up. So we're getting into these uh, proposed instructions based off of that scenario that Judge Cannon had presented. Scenario A, the jury is incorrectly instructed that the defendant is authorized to possess any personal records regardless of classification, and the jury is then asked to determine whether each document is personal or presidential. Any jury instruction premised on the erroneous legal supposition set forth in Scenario A would necessarily be deeply flawed. Scenario, <coughs> excuse me. Scenario A posits that the jury would be instructed to determine as a factual matter whether the documents charged in counts 1 through 32 qualified as presidential or personal records as defined by the PRA. But that would be asking the jury to make a factual finding with no proper legal connection to the charges in this case because the PRA designation is irrelevant to the issue of authorization under Section 793 and thus is not relevant to whether Trump was authorized under executive order 13526 to possess classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. The PRA does not speak to authorization to possess classified information, let alone in an unsecured facility. The government nonetheless set, sets forth below draft text for such an instruction as directed by the court with the status of the documents as presidential or personal records being a question for the jury, unauthorized, unauthorized possession. Footnote 22 here, the instructions for other elements being unauthorized possession would be the same as those set forth in the proposed ones above. Unauthorized possession means possession without official approval or permission. The United States government has adopted rules that govern the possession of classified information. Those rules do not apply to a sitting president, but apply to a former president after their term in office has ended. Under those rules, an individual's possession of classified information is unauthorized. If that individual does not hold a security clearance, or the individual does not have a need to know the information. Need to know means the appropriate government official has determined that the individual requires access to the classified information in order to perform or assist in a lawful and authorized government function. In addition, even if an individual holds a security clearance and has a need to know classified information, the individual's possession, possession of the classified information is unauthorized if the individual removes the classified information from a secure facility or possesses the information outside of a secure facility. I instruct you, however, that as to a former president, even if he lacks security clearance, lacks a need to know classified information, and stores information outside of a secure facility, he is authorized to do so if the classified information is contained within a personal record, as that term is defined by the Presidential Records Act, a statute that establishes the public ownership of presidential records and ensures the preservation of presidential records for public access after the termination of a presidential's term in office. 
footnote 23, citing Armstrong v. Bush and the Presidential Records Act. Even if he lacks security clearance and lacks the need to know and stores the information outside the facility, he's authorized to do it. The Presidential Records Act. Wow. 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 Therefore, determine if the defendant had unauthorized possession of the documents charged in counts 1 through 32. You must determine whether each document was a presidential record or a personal record within the meaning of the PRA. I will now instruct you on those terms. The term presidential record means any documentary material or any reasonably segregable portion thereof created or received by the president, the president's immediate staff, or a unit or individual of the executive office of the president whose function is to advise or assist the president in the course of conducting activities which relate to or have an effect upon carrying out the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. Footnote 24, citing U.S. Code Section 2201 sub 2, presidential records do not include personal records. And then we're citing 42 U.S. Code 2201 2B. The term personal record means any documentary material or any reasonably segregable portion thereof of a purely private and non-public character which do not relate to or have an effect upon carrying out the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president and includes a diaries, journals, or other personal notes serving as the functional equivalent of a diary or journal which are not prepared or utilized for or circulated in or communicated in the course of transacting government business. B, material relating to private political associations and have no relation to or direct effect upon the carrying out of constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. And C, materials relating exclusively to the president's own election to the office of the presidency and materials directly relating to the election of a particular individual or individuals to federal, state, or local. I'm sorry, everyone, I'm pausing because I'm looking for count four, which has to do with the nuclear uh, codes information. I don't see that covered under A, B, or C here. We do have two documents with nuclear information that was included. Apparently that's going to be covered under here somehow. I'm not sure why. Okay. A local office which have no relation or to or direct effect upon the carrying out of constitutional statutory or other official or ceremonial duties of the president footnote 26 44 united states code section 2201 subsection c scenario b the jury is incorrectly instructed that the defendant is authorized to possess any record that he designated as personal and is further incorrectly instructed that by failing to transfer the charged documents to nara the uh, defendant made the unreviewable decision to designate the charged document as personal Like scenario A, proposed scenario B rests on the erroneous and unsupported legal proposition that the designation of records as either personal or presidential under the PRA has an impact on whether persons are authorized to possess classified documents under section 793E. It has no impact, but scenario B also incorporates additional layers of erroneous legal propositions at the core of Trump's legally flawed and factually unsupported PRA defense. As to this scenario, the jury instruction would amount to nothing more than a resuscitation of Trump's PRA defense as presented in his motion to dismiss and would result in directing a verdict against the government. Well, that doesn't seem right, does it? As set forth above, the court should deny Trump's motion to dismiss and reject any such jury instruction. Nevertheless, as directed by the courts, the government sets forth below a draft jury instruction regarding unauthorized possession that assumes scenario B to be a correct formulation of the law. <coughs> oh my goodness. Unauthorized possession. Unauthorized possession means possession without official approval or permission. The United States government has adopted rules that govern the possession of classified information. Those rules do not apply to a sitting president, but apply to former presidents. After their term in office has ended under those rules, an individual's possession of classified information is
unauthorized if that individual does not hold security clearance or the individual does not have a need to know the information. Need to know means an appropriate government official has determined that that individual requires access to the classified information in order to perform or assist in lawful and authorized government function. In addition, even if an individual holds a security clearance and has a need to know classified information, the individual's possession of the classified information is unauthorized if the individual removes the classified information from a secure facility and possesses the information outside of a secure facility. I instruct you, however, that as to former president, even if he lacks security clearance, lacks a need to know classified information and stores information outside of a secure facility, he's authorized to do so if the classified information is contained within a personal record within the meaning of the Presidential Records Act, a statute that establishes the public ownership of presidential records and ensures the preservation of presidential records for public access after the termination of a president's term in office. So again, just as a quick side note, everybody here. So a statute that establishes the public ownership of presidential records and ensures the preservation of presidential records for public access after the termination of the presidential's term. So if we're saying, if we're going up here, let's just go back here. It's contained within a personal record within the meaning of Presidential Records Act. So that would mean then the nuclear information that he declares as personal information would be available to the public, I think, as a jury instruction. All right then. The PRA defines the term personal records to mean all documentary materials or any reasonable segregable portion thereof of a purely private or non-public character which do not relate to or have an effect upon the carrying out of the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president and includes a diaries, journals, or other personal notes serving as the functional equivalent of a diary or journal uh, which are not prepared or utilized for or circulated or communicated in the course of transacting government business. B, materials relating to private political associations and have no relation to or direct effect upon carrying out constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. And C, materials relating exclusively to the president's own election, to the office of the presidency, and materials directly relating to the election of a particular individual or individuals to fate, federal, state, done everyone we're coming down to the end or local office which have no relation to or direct effect upon the carrying out of constitutional statutory or other official or ceremonial duties of the president sorry i'm just wondering if the nuclear codes are ceremonial by contrast, the PRA defines the term presidential records to mean any documentary materials or any reasonably segregable portion thereof created or received by the president that the president's immediate staff or a unit or individual of the executive office of the president whose function it is to advise or assist the president in the course of conducting activities which relate to or have an effect upon carrying out the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. Presidential records do not include personal records. I further instruct you that a president has unreviewable authority to designate any record whatsoever as <coughs> I further instruct you that a president has unreviewable authority to designate any record whatsoever as personal regardless of whether it meets the statutory definitions I have just provided. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, spicy. <laughs> I further instruct you that if before the end of his term in office, a president transfers records will in the White House to any location other than the National Archives and Records Administration, all alleged in the superseding indictment, <laughs> he has necessarily exercised his unreviewable authority to designate those records as personal. <laughs> And as a matter of law, he is authorized to possess them, and you may not find him guilty. <laughs> I apologize, everybody. This is this is the spicy, this is the spicy portion here. Okay, you may not find him <laughs> guilty. All right. Conclusion. For the reasons set forth above, and in the government's opposition to Trump's motion to dismiss based upon the PRA. 
the court should reject the legal premise that the PRA's distinction between personal and presidential records has any bearing on the element of unauthorized possession under Section 793E. As such, it should deny Trump's pending motion to dismiss and adopt preliminary jury instructions. <coughs> Excuse me as proposed by the government above. If, however, the court does not reject the erroneous legal premise, it should make that decision clear now, long before jeopardy attaches, to allow the government to the opportunity to seek appellate review. <laughs> Respectfully submitted, Jack Smith, <laughs> special counsel. Oh my goodness gracious. And then, <coughs> excuse me, and then we do have a verdict form here. Uh, this is just what a verdict form looks like. Very simply, um, you just set out your counts and then you set out guilty or not guilty. So I think if memory serves, if memory serves everybody, I believe it's count four and count 18 are the nuclear codes information. All right, with that, I will go ahead and turn on comments, everyone. So we have made it through. Uh, that document so we can do a Q&A and see how that goes. All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome in. Welcome. Thanks for coming by tonight. <coughs> hello, hello. <coughs> Spicy. <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. I will be posting this on my Tube of You channel uh, tomorrow. So usually I don't give a specific date or time on my post, but this one uh, I do want to make sure I have up tomorrow. But several people asked me for it. So what was your favorite part? I kind of liked the end where he he's like, look, if you don't want to follow the law, it's fine. Then he's not guilty. <laughs> Did to show his hand on the PRA section? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All right, let me see here. All of this seems, it feels like an irrelevant exercise is what all of this is. I think this is an exercise for Judge Cannon, <laughs> maybe. Maybe this could be a learning opportunity for Judge Cannon, perhaps. I think J Jack is done with Cannon. Yeah, I think he's done. I think he's done, everybody. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Hello, Suze. Hello. Dumped a whole lot of, yes, yes, I think so. I think Jack is, <laughs> I think Jack's done. I think Jack has uh, set out pretty clearly. If we're gonna do this, just tell me because I'm gonna appeal ya. Cause I think I think he's done. <laughs> he's like I'm over. <laughs> yes, the defining terms. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, he, I think I think he's right. I think he's done. I think he's done. Yes, my <coughs> my voice is okay, everyone. I still have this lingering cough, so. <laughs> Defense verdict sheet had two awkward questions. I didn't understand theirs. Yes, so I do have the defense side, um, but I didn't think I'd be able to make it through both of them for tonight, but I will definitely be going through the defense one as well. Happy birthday week. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, but ignore the definition I just gave. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I do plan um, everyone to... Uh, be back on Friday for my next live. And so I would like to go through uh, Mr. Trump's uh, proposed because he he just set his out differently. He just filed like three or four pages explaining like, well, you know, hey, this is really important, you know, and then a whole bunch of um, irrelevant stuff. And then he filed a whole bunch of exhibits. <laughs> yes, the Mandivus. Yes, of course, of course. So let's talk about that. He needs, well, we're getting, I think we're getting close. I think this is the moment where Jack's just like, oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Did you see that Trump violated the gag order again? Oh, I'm not, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I think we were all waiting. So a writ of a mandamus, everyone, uh, very, uh, not utilized very much. Uh, it's, done at the state level for different reasons, but at the federal level, it really is just asking a court to force another court to do something or to force another uh, legal body to do something. So 
uh, one of the things he could do as a writ of mandamus would be to request uh, Cannon's removal. That would need to be done through a writ of mandamus. So he can appeal her decision if she decides to come out and say uh, the presidential records are important here. <laughs> if she wants to do that, he can appeal that. That's just appealatory. Or <laughs> appealatory. That's an interlocutory appeal. But if he wants to actually remove her, he would have to file a writ of mandibus or mandamus in order to pull her from the case. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful, very uh, rarely used, but... Yeah, no, the judge, um, you know, Judge Marshawn has uh, been keeping pretty tight rein. I already put together a post on his uh, rejection of the immunity defense and a rejection of um, tossing some of the evidence. I'm not sure if it's posted at this point or not. I keep trying to kind of move my uh, technique around so that I can get a few posts with the information before TikTok catches me. <laughs> I was able to get three up, so I guess there's that. <laughs> but yeah, so a macadamia nuts. Well, that is, I would say, definitely tastier. Oh, did the immunity? Oh, thank goodness. Thanks, Estelle, for telling me. Yeah, I, oh, it's so frustrating. <coughs> it's so frustrating because I kind of have to hop around in different ways of uh, showing you the documents um, for some reason. They just really are careful about that. So we'll see. Yeah, I thought Jack did a pretty good job. I, I like how we're not even, <coughs> we're not even two pages in and he's like, um, yeah, so I'm going to appeal that. It's not even two paragraphs. We have one paragraph, two paragraphs, and in his third paragraph, He's like, hi, yeah, we're going to appeal. <laughs> oh, my gosh, I thought that was so funny. Had a cough for almost two. Oh, I know. I can't seem to get rid of it. Oh, I know, I know. I know. I'm trying, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he only made it two paragraphs, but he said it multiple times. He also explained, you know, this is completely erroneous, and this is like, you know, why, why am I giving a jury instruction on the uh, defense argument? Why am I doing that? I'm so glad he's saying, oh yeah, I think he's, I think he's at a point now. I think the last order, well, you know, I posted on the last order multiple times because the last order was ridiculous. It was just ridiculous. Really pineapple juice. Oh, I'll try that. But it was ridiculous, everybody. It, it hit, it hit a point, uh, it hit a level I have not seen before and I've seen a lot. <laughs> I've seen a lot. Oh my gosh, I've seen a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes myself on my filings. I've screwed up filings before, but I've not seen anything that that bonkers. <laughs> that was crazy. I can't even imagine, uh, you know, Jack's face when he saw it. He would just be like, oh, for goodness sake, with stronger words. <coughs> really, castor oil. Oh, I'll have to try that. Yeah, at this point, it's just lingering for sure. Tired of messing around. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm so glad. I hope it helps. I know that there's <coughs> there's a lot of questions going around. And, you know, a lot of this language, you're just not using it every day. Like, mandamus, who uses that? Like, I didn't even spell it right. <laughs> I didn't even spell mandamus right. Mandamus. Stupid Latin. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, you, you're not using this all the time. There's no reason why anyone should know this unless you're in the field of <laughs> the sarcasm. Yes, yes. Uh, I think the DC case, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer, everybody. We're going to be in arguments before you know it. We are going to be right up against arguments um, in the Supreme Court, and I would be shocked um, if things don't get heated, I think we're definitely cruising. Mandibus, <laughs> mandamus, mandibus, whatever, you know, potato, potato. <laughs> it's Latin. <laughs> I know, I know. April's here, everybody. We are just like less than two weeks away from this criminal trial in New York. Uh, and then right up on the heels of that, we've got um, the arguments in uh, the Supreme Court. I mean, it's really coming down. Yes, DC's on hold because of SCOTUS. So I have no doubt that they're going to hit the ground running. 
Um, you know, again, we're not sure exactly where, when we're going to hear back from SCOTUS. Um, you know, the prediction's kind of in the June area because they break for the summer because they're working so hard, you know, with that. I'm going to keep my comments to myself. <laughs> but they break for the summer. So that'll definitely be, um, I think that we'll have something before then. <coughs> and then that'll get us back on the docket. That'll get us up and running in D.C. There's going to be motions flying left and right. We still have two motions for dismiss in the D.C. case that the judge hasn't responded to yet. So she's probably got that stuff up and ready to go. So basically, as soon as as soon as she gets it back, as soon as that ball gets hit back to her, she's going to be like, OK, let's do let's let's do this. Don't keep your comments to yourself. Well, sometimes it's probably best. Yeah, so SCOTUS, you know, it's a quick and quick and easy way of saying the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah, yeah, just quick and easy. <laughs> quick and easy. No clue what the actual trial's about. Well, you know, surprisingly, it happens. It, it really can happen. Because, you know, if you're a new judge and you haven't handled a lot of cases, you know, every, every case you get is going to be your first case on that kind of issue. So, you know, that's just kind of how, how it works. And uh, this one just has so much behind it, though. There's just so much more. Happy birthday. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Guess up those RVs and hit the roads. True. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, everybody. I'm struggling. I'm, I'm struggling with the, uh, with the Supreme Court right now. Absence on that day. Well, you know. <coughs> yeah. Conflict of interest, it's happening. What's happening in the Florida case since the DC case is on hold? So, right. So today uh, they had to have, well, yesterday they had to have their proposed jury instructions in. So um, the government had theirs in here. And then uh, Trump has also filed his and the other, the other defendants. So I will go through those on my next live because, you know, you got to have both sides of the story, everybody. So... We'll have those in as well. We had two paperless orders that had come down from Judge Cannon. One was on, you know, speedy trial reports for defendants. So she said, hey, defendants, you guys want to do your speedy trial reports, you know, like you're supposed to or what? So uh, those should be coming out hopefully soon. And then she also denied a Pro Hoc Vice a request from a group of uh, people who wanted to be uh, pulled into the case. So... Uh, she denied that request as well. So those were the two paperless orders that came out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reading this. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. I I apologize for I still have a little bit of a cough, uh, but I'm almost I'm almost back. Yeah, she had two today, James. You got it. Yep, exactly, exactly right. So, and I think it'll be interesting to see what the response is to this. Although I don't know when it'll come out, I wouldn't say that a response is really you know, needed quickly, but she's got a lot of stuff that she needs to respond to. She's got a whole bunch of, or a whole bunch of motions she's not responded to yet, like a whole bunch of them. So, I mean, she's got a stack, so she needs to kind of get in there. Yeah, two paperless orders. Uh, I think they were actually filed yesterday, but yeah, that's, those are the last, the latest uh, orders from Judge Cannon are two paperless orders. The rest... <laughs> Oh, I know, I know. I'll I'll be here. I'll be here for sure. Definitely. I'm uh I'm still working. We've still got some very interesting things going down in New York still. We've got some more orders there uh that are going to be coming out pretty soon. I think the closer we get to the New York case, the more desperate things you're going to get and the more you're going to see this same order over and over and over again that it wasn't timely filed. Like you've missed your deadline. You've missed your deadline. At this point, Mr. Trump is just missing deadlines uh, for any kind of extra filings. So, uh, you know, at this point, we've got it. We're basically good to go for New York. We're, we're set. Two graining leaves to motion. Okay, okay. Did you see his appeal in New York was denied because they submitted wrong? So I didn't. What, are you talking about his bond, Mads? Are you talking about the, the bond? I've heard some rumors about that. You have the same appellate rights with paperless orders. Yes. You have the same appellate rights, but uh, it's more difficult to appeal a paperless order because you've got to have grounds uh, to 
properly appeal. And a paperless order doesn't usually have enough information to appeal off of, okay, yeah, the bond, yeah, the bond. So I've heard that. I've heard that going around. I do not, I have the bond order uh, that he, that was signed. So I do have that, but I don't have any other legal paperwork um, on, let's see, let me see my paperwork's all over the place. I don't have, boy, I don't even know where that's at now. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe my cats ate it. <laughs> yeah, I just have the bond order. Um, I don't have the, uh, any paperwork yet on any problems with the bond, but I have heard yeah, yeah. So, so the thing about bonds, everybody, <laughs> about any kind of surety bonds is, you know, there could potentially be problems if the uh, company that you're going through isn't like, you know, creme de la creme. And if you've got a bond of $175 million, you know, I would be surprised if you're not one of the top, the absolute top bond companies in the world. You know, I, I'm not surprised that they're like, wait a minute, we want to see some numbers. <laughs> we want to see that. So I'm not surprised about that. It sounds like though there was like a signature that was in the wrong place. You know, that's, you know, whatever. But um, he, it's still, his bond's still going to be going through. It's just one of those situations where they're like, this is a lot of money. We need to be sure. Oh, tagged me in a video. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll have to double check on that. You want to prove the the company can cover exactly Michelle. So, from from what I can tell, again, and I haven't seen any paperwork, but from what I can tell, the the uh, question here is they're like, all right, well, you posted this, but we need to know that you're good for it, and you need to kind of you know move your paper around because you made some clerical errors. So that's what it sounds like to me. There's a chance that he could still be in trouble if their financials that they file don't match up, that they can't actually cover it. If for some reason, I don't know anything about this company, everybody, but if for some reason they file the paperwork and they can't cover it, then we could have some trouble. So that's still possible. But um, other than that, you know, he's still good to go. Response to the jury instructions. Uh, Kyle, I've got them. Uh, I am going to go through them on a live. I've been reading through them. I... Yes, <laughs> there's my answer. Ah, sigh. Yes, I have. <laughs> I have. I have read them, and I do want to go through. Uh, and then my next live, I will be reading through those for sure, for sure. Can Trump delay the New York trial uh, by firing his attorneys? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no. So you have to get permission to leave. Like if, if you remember a Tacopino, I can't remember his name. The taco guy, the taco, <laughs> the taco fella in the E. Jean Carroll case, like he, he wanted to leave the night before, but he still had to file with the court and the court had to give him permission. So if Trump wants to fire his people, the court's got to give him permission. So because a lot of people would try to do that. You said it right. Okay, great. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you've you've got to get permission in order to leave. And sometimes the judge will just say, no, look, we're we're going into trial. Do you want to get rid of your attorneys? It's too late now. Appeal it later. Taco left because he knew he couldn't <coughs> can't benefit from your own terrible. <laughs> exactly, Matt. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, you know, if he he probably could have left a little sooner, I think. I think there was a fundamental question or a fundamental line that um, Mr. Takapino refused to cross that, uh, you know, somebody put their foot down and was like, we're doing it. And he's like, I'm out of here then. I think that's really what happened. Had it in his contract. Right, right. I can never remember if an, oh, if an O or an A. I know, I know. I know. I And, you know, he, was, he is, I'm not even going to say he was. I mean, he is an exceptional attorney. So, you know, he he knew what he was doing, but I think he really there was really a line that he was like, I am not going past that line, people. So. And I, well, yes, but I also think part of it had to do with theory of the case, quite frankly. And if you look 
at how uh, their defense was put together such that it was, uh, you can kind of see how uh, the defense kind of took a couple of like, you know, low blows, like, you know, kind of, I mean, it was technically okay that they went down the road they went down, but, you know, a few of the roads they were going down were just kind of like, you know, not like kind of sleazy. And so I, my guess, this is just my guess. My guess is he didn't want to play the sleazy role. He didn't want to do the sleazy work. And he was like, look, I'm not going to do it. And so he walked. That was my guess. Oh, nails and ring. Oh, thanks. Yes, this is my black onyx. So a little bit of that for fun. What's the bottom line? Well, uh, you'll have to be more specific. <laughs> There's too many cases. Uh, <laughs> which which case do you want the bottom line? <coughs> I think he's, I have heard this. Oh, yeah, yeah, repetitive. Yeah, but repetitive's okay. You've got to be repetitive when, uh, in, with your jury instructions like this. That's very normal. That's very typical. Million dollars wasted. Oh, I know, I know. I know. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot, everybody. This whole thing is exhausting. And there's orders coming out left and right. There's motions being filed left and right. There's like, you know, it's exhausting. The whole thing. The whole thing is exhausting for sure. I, you know, even just today, I felt like, you know, I was running around like, wait, what just happened? He did what now? What? It's like, come on. And there still are a whole bunch of other things going on in the world. Like, you know, I've still been trying to make it through the Florida cases that came out of the Supreme Court. There were two major cases that came out of the Supreme Court. I still have not been able to make it through because there's just been so much stuff going on. Entertaining. I think that's an excellent way of putting it. Exhausting, but entertaining. True, true. So much learning to be had. So many learning experiences here. <laughs> Have many people working with them? It depends on who they are. Federal judge uh, probably has, <coughs> excuse me, has a higher budget than most of our state judges. State judges, oh, they're so lucky if they have anyone helping them. Poor state judges, I feel bad for them. But our federal judges, yeah, they've they've probably got some support. Mm -hmm. Although I heard uh, that Judge Cannon uh, lost a couple, but again, just rumor, unsubstantiated. I don't have any paperwork. I was stressed he did something every single day. Well, yeah, yeah. That's the thing too is, uh, you know, one of the things projects I've been working on is going through and looking through the executive orders. And, you know, if nothing else, at least we're not looking at executive orders every day that could be like, you know, and we're done with the Constitution signed, you know, executive order, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> at least we're not there. So there's that two clerks. Okay. Two to four clerks. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing opportunity as a clerk to be able to put that on your resume. But I mean, it's hard work. It is hard, hard work. Download this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Download it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I'll have this posted on my tube of you tomorrow, everyone. So, and again, I don't usually give a, a specified date and time, but I've made a, I uh, made a promise to someone that I would get it uploaded. So I'll do that for sure. One pregnancy, two unknown, third refused. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you, the clerks are coming and going all the time, coming and going all the time. Yeah, he, it seems like, you know, from MSNBC and the clerks. Okay, excellent. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, it seems like, you know, when you, whenever I look at it, like if you spill something on the carpet, I guess, and, you know, it's like a, a spill, it's a stain, but then you start to try to clean it up and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because you're not doing it right. That's kind of how I view Mr. Trump. I feel like he just is like using the wrong stuff to clean up his mess. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Will I be on tomorrow? So uh, I will not be on tomorrow, everyone. I am going to uh, lecture, so I'm very excited about that. But I will be back on Friday. So I will post Friday morning uh, just to confirm that I will be back on Friday and then let everybody know kind of what the topic was that seems to work out. So um, I will definitely be back. Uh, Friday is looking good. Yep. I would like to cover Mr. Trump's side again. I think it's really important to kind of get both aspects so you can see where everyone's coming from. And for some reason, I feel like there should be another order coming down from uh, Judge Marshawn too. So perfect comparison. <laughs> it's a stain. 
I know, I know, Kristen, I know. I know. <laughs> I know, I'm a dork. I'm a big dork. <laughs> Happy birthday. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Hands move majority crazy. Oh, I know, I know. How can we tune in? Oh, Kyle, no, it's something local. It's a, a local, <laughs> it's a local uh, at my uh at the church down the road. So I'm afraid, I'm afraid I won't be able to tune everybody in, but I'll, I'll give you the highlights. Uh, it's a very interesting conversation that will, that should be had. So I'm very looking forward to it. It should be very interesting. Yeah, no, it's actually uh, the, they have this really neat series where they pull in incredibly controversial people and then you can ask them lots of questions. <laughs> so there are some um, extremists that are coming. <laughs> How do I put this? There's an extremist coming <laughs> and so he can ask a lot of questions. Explain paperless orders. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could. A paperless order is just a quick and dirty way for the court to make a decision real quick, get it on the record, uh, as opposed to writing out a full order. So when you have a full order written out, everything's kind of set out, one, two, three, four, five. But with a paperless order, it still holds uh, the power of an order, but it's just, you know, quick and dirty on that. Yes, it is fascinating. <laughs> it is fascinating. I won't be taking my popcorn, but I want to. I really want to take my popcorn <laughs> so I can throw it. <laughs> But I won't, because we're the building that we're in is a church. <laughs> so I won't throw the popcorn. <laughs> Unreviewable authority. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. What did Jack mean by unreviewable authority to designate docs as personal? So what he was saying there, <coughs> what... Uh, Kyle, that's probably one of the most important things out of this whole thing was what he was saying was um, what she was proposing or how she was putting it down was just saying basically that so apparently there is no one that can review the authority that the president has. Um, nobody can say whether or not he was OK. If, if the road she wants to go down is using the Presidential Records Act instead of properly using the law, then what she is saying is basically that, you know, no one can touch the president. So I thought that was an incredibly important point. So I've done a church stop you there with popcorn. <laughs> no. Oh, no. I'm kind of out in the middle of nowhere, so we don't really have a lot of places to go out here, everyone. So everybody ends up at the church or at one of the 15 churches. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I thought Jack did an amazing job. So he's basically saying under these orders, there's nothing we can do. And why are we here? Exactly, Kyle. That's exactly right. He's basically saying, if you want to go down this road, then, you know, there is no one to check the president. There is no one. If, if you aren't willing to follow the law, judge, then, you know, then we're done. We're done. Yeah. I know. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> That's kind of what happens when you're, you know, out in the sticks, everybody, is that y'all y'all get together for <laughs> Jack being spicy. Yes, yes, <laughs> quick and dirty. Well, I mean, that's what we do, I and mean, that's how it is. Is that weird? <laughs> is that... Oh, dear. <laughs> i said too much. Oh, my goodness. MTD. <laughs> Uh, nothing but still have 50 tr I know, I know, right, right? I know. I mean, we don't even have a Burger King. I, I'm just like, can we swap? I mean, we have like, you know, 15 churches and like four of them are one particular kind of church. I'm like, can we swap it for Burger King? I mean, is it, <laughs> I mean, it's all the same. It's all the same denomination. <laughs> I've said too much. I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. But I would trade one of the churches for a Burger King, is all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I should. Oh, dear. <laughs> the lightning's going to strike any time now. Is it odd to ask for the jury to decide the nature of the documents, personal versus... Yeah, it is odd. It is odd. Church for Burger King. Well, well I'm just saying. I mean, we got a lot of churches. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to promote 
any one place, but you know, I mean, there's only so much wafers you can have. <laughs> oh my gosh, not in and out. No, no, I mean, I don't care. I, I really, at this point, I don't care what it is. But, <laughs> oh my gosh, well, we've got some Starbucks. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm just kidding. I'm just getting myself into trouble, everybody. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying, Lisa. <sighs> Other fast places? Yeah, exactly. You know, it could be Wendy's. I don't, I don't care. There's just too many churches all in one spot. It's like, you know, we need to have some more service <laughs> industries. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You like flies with your man <laughs> burger. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, everybody. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, indeed. Uh, what are the odds that Jack appeals? I think if Judge Cannon comes back and says, and digs her heels in and says, you know what? The PRE is important here. I think at that moment we'll have an appeal. I think we will definitely definitely have an appeal <coughs> at that point once church gets oh i know <laughs> especially when you only have one or two restaurants <laughs> and 15 churches all get out at the same time <laughs> two restaurants in your whole town <laughs> the five guys oh dear he's probably writing it oh yeah i think he's <laughs> he's been writing it yeah he's been working on it she going to take her time answering it? Well, she's certainly taking her time answering all of the others. <laughs> so it seems like it. I don't think she would. Mm. <laughs> Equal amount of bars to churches. No. <laughs> no, there's not. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious, everyone. But... Chick-fil-A, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, they need to like do a mashup. You know, one church is like half Chick-fil-A, half church. I'm not trying to say I'm against churches. I'm just saying I'm for, you know, eateries is what I'm trying to say. Paperless orders for the speedy. So that's a good question, Suze. So I plan to do a post on it uh, because we've had, I think, eight uh, reports from the prosecutor at this point, and I've I've kind of gone through those. I think it's eight. I've gone through, and it's just a quick like update, and it's because of how the statute's written. So that's one aspect. But I want to take a look at uh, where the defendants are at because I'm not sure if they filed anything or not. So I'm glad you brought it up. I do plan to do a specific post just going into that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, because of her paperless order today. So I wanted to, um, you know, check it out because I, I've gone through that docket so many times and I've not seen a single one from them. And this, I mean, we're like almost a year out, so they should have had something filed in there by now. Yes. So awesome. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, everybody, I will have to say goodbye for tonight. <laughs> goodness i uh, always a pleasure to hang out with everyone i appreciate all of you so much um <laughs> so i should have um i should be posting when some new orders come out i will be posting these orders much more frequently now that they're really coming out quite frequently so keep an eye out for that so uh have a wonderful night everybody oh thank you for the sweet birthday wishes for my birthday week i'm uh, so very thankful and yes thank you to the moderators um i'm very thankful to all of you i really do appreciate it i will have this particular live posted on youtube or my tube of you either later tonight or first thing tomorrow this one will be up uh, within the next 24 hours. I've had uh, so many requests for it. So uh, keep an eye on that. And my tube of you is the same name as my name here. So uh, you can watch for this there. So thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Desert skies. It's always good to see you all. So take care. Have a great night. And I will be back on Friday.